Okay, good evening everybody. As promised, um, I promised this one person I was going to try to make a short video to explain what I was talking about before, um, and I'm going to try to make it as brief as possible. Um, although it may not sound like it at first, this is about what is happening uh, right now in the States with Black Lives Matter and the argument uh, versus those who want to substitute or, or say it's about, it's it should be all lives matter and that whole argument I got into. It is also something that will explain a lot of civil ideologies that are ravaging the West right now, political arguments and civil arguments that are splitting and dividing societies in several countries. It's almost like having the basic knowledge of subtraction, multiplication, addition in order to, and, and knowing your tables and so forth, uh, and knowing how to do simple divisions and multiplications in order to be able to go on to algebra and trigonometry and every other kind of math. You first need to understand the basics. Well, no, I don't know where the pause is. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. So, the way the human mind is configured primarily, essentially, in its cognizance is a perspective on itself, its species, its, its own uh, living form reality, the living form reality of itself, of its kind, and a perception upon the world it must exist in, to which it is subject and vulnerable to, dependent. So these two forces have basically generated, uh, started uh, sort of configuring the mind, sort of like the, the psychote first gets uh, split into two cells, and then four cells, and then eight cells, and then 16 cells, until it gets to be a fetus. Well, the very, very source of how our mind is structured, you could say, is analogous to this. The part of our mind that um, under, has self-perception of its own species, of its own kind, amongst all living forms in this world, has two general um, notions in itself. One is automatic and not very elaborating. It's what it knows it needs and what it wants, um, what it feels, what it feels it must do, what it has to procure. There is, it's not complex, it's the most innately ingrained, simplified, expression of self-perception intelligence. And then there's the part that understands the rest of the species, everyone else, and all the complexities that that entails. At the same time, that is divided into, is, is composed by two um, areas. One is what I have come to understand I am seen like or perceived, which is a reflection also of how I see individuals and, the, and others, and my own self-perception, and then get into psychology and how realistic or how, um, how veered off that may be depending on conditions of, 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 of self-perception. But there is basically two areas ourselves and how important we are to others. Anyways, this type of categorization is very essential and it is important to understand that all of these initial first uh, areas come or rather reside in one fundamental all-encompassing notion which is 
I am a collective species. The first thing uh, that takes precedence, the first thing that occupies our self-perception and the perception of others and the knowledge, the innate automatic knowledge of my kind, my living form, is a collective. It is not self-perception, an individual self-perception, and then a relationship to others. Although I have described these uh, these areas, uh, in reality, it starts with the perception of a collective because there's something more fundamentally important to the survival of the species, which is that the collective works well together. Evolution and creation does not create a single, a single version of a prototype and then goes on to make a polarity, a, sorry, a plurality. It starts by creating multiple individuals. It starts by creating the collective, it conceives of the living form in a collective manner. This is absolutely fundamental for us to understand. In every single human science and social, political, civil, ideology, reasoning, all of these moralities that are, that are everybody's obsessed with, um, with governing and uh, applying and expecting and fulfilling, it affects all of these because what matters to the most silent, most profound part of our mind is that the collective exists. It's like zero. It's like before one. It's zero starting point. Everything gets measured and starts getting built from that zero point, from the point of zero collective. So, for example, if one of us goes off floats away onto the ocean and separates from the, group, from the group, from the clan. The first thing that is alerted, whether it be in the individual floating in the ocean, whether it be uh, in the group that remains on the island, is the fact that one has separated, whether it's yourself and, and want to get back to your, your group, or whether it is the group that, is, that has become aware that one has spread out. That is the first, the very first cognizant alarm bell that goes off in the species, regardless of it being a, a group or an individual. Because it all starts from group. So when you separate something from the group, the group, which means all individuals and the group, has a reaction, a reaction to that separation. That is the first thing that is noticed, that is... Um, that is a sign of something going wrong and it is the first thing that we uh, it may not seem to us in the modern world but it's the first thing that creates instability and disruption that we try to fix okay and I can't pause okay because I don't know where the pause button is I'm afraid that if I stop recording it will just stop recording so this is, it's very important to understand this because we are born with this already wired into the, the neurology of the species. In fact, there are so human sciences, uh, everything is a science, math, language, uh, history, whatever you want to talk about. The, the production of self-awareness by human intellect is a science always because it it purports to understand the, the form and the creation of nature, of evolution, how life came to be. And as soon as we try to reason how this happened and why this occurs, whether it's in living forms or in nature, it becomes a science of deduction and affirmation, uh, evidence and facts, and, and we start building the the social intelligence of civilization and in all of the in various forms of sciences. So as far as people are concerned and humanity is concerned, we have human sciences of concept 
social behavior and developmental nature of developmental nature like psychology like psychology sociology there is uh, neurological biological sciences uh, that speak of how our brain is wired and triggered to automatically behave a certain way given our chemistry biology and neurology and um, then then we have the social civil I mean civil political sciences which purport to uh, in, uh, install or rather uh, apply uh, philo philo social philosophies uh, which become political philosophies of social governance and social behavior and how and how we should respect how we should run a society and a country all of them starts all of them start from how we are made because how we are made asks for things to continue being a certain way for things to not be trans transgressed for things to be honored when things hurt us or offend us or wound our sensitivities we create morality we create rules and then we start configuring the different areas of civil human sciences but they all start from biology every single thing that is a political value even in the law eventually originally started with something that our body asks for uh, for somebody to not to, uh, to not disrespect our family to not injure our children so that creates uh, a justification a real natural reason it, it hurts me it scares me it offends me it makes me want to hurt uh, and disrupt society and go after the person that hurt my family so we create laws that are, uh, stem from natural things that happen in anybody anybody would react that's when they become social laws right so let me just cut to the chase because I don't want to make this long like I promised when it comes to our races the way the the critical order of of the human mind is made is formed is wired in the context of what I was just explaining first thing that we recognize in order to maintain the group, which like I said was like a prime directive of, of, the, of, the, of the species, is that it's another human being. And that's the most important, that's the cornerstone. It doesn't matter what that person, if that person is handicapped, if that person is crawling on the floor, jumping from one tree to another, it is blue, green, pink, uh, whatever that you can the first thing we'll seek to recognize is if is if it is the same species and that is to us everything because the collective needs to exist and so what we first want to confirm always as the very first check mark is that it's another one of us because the collective must exist when we later evolve our intelligence basically has two general areas. One is the natural, intuitive, innate sense of what is. I know I need food to grow and eat and have energy and not be hungry. And that is never going to change. And then there is how I can make food happen beyond what nature offers me. That part of intelligence that led to agriculture, hunting, and ways uh, skills of fishing and climbing trees and what have you is the uh, precocious so-called more advanced uh, intelligence okay it's the place of the more advanced intelligence that human beings have compared to the rest of living forms on the planet we uh, are we stand alone this way right we can if you can just take that intelligence and measure it against beavers building dams and the very complex intelligence of dolphins and whales in the ocean what have you no matter what other creature we are eons ahead and this could lead to theology and why it is so and the books and scripture talks about how we 
uh, are meant to have dominion in the world, but then sciences also uh, say we are the apex creature or uh, life form on the planet, what have you. So that intelligence, you can isolate that quality of intelligence, is not necessarily harmonized with the intelligence that simply is and knows the automatic, basic, intuitive intelligence. It is like the leading spearhead of life wanting to evolve and become smarter and therefore survive. Because survival and becoming smarter and evolve being faster and protecting yourself in order to survive better and more effectively is all part of the same pushing sort of icebreaker intelligence that is this particular category of intelligence. It should and ought to because it does serve the same species and its prime directive of survival of the collective, but it is sort of like the spoiled, almost too intelligent for its own good child. It is uh, like an adolescent that is a, a little bit too eager and push it. It all, it's like a sperm. It just has to push and push and push and push and it will fall by the side and make tons of mistakes. And in, in, in the ambition to push forward for the whole collective through each individual harder than anything. And so in that intelligence, that category of intelligence, lies all our illustrious sciences. Maths, engineering, the way we talk about the values in history and psychology and sociology and every single human science resides in this category of intelligence. Now, in there also we find civil values and principles that we talk about when we say a country is doing what it ought to and how we're running it and it's good, it's bad, it's a good or a bad political system and what have you. It's all part of this area of intelligence. Now, let's go to the example of a baby encountering another baby of a different skin color. And let's compare that to adults who have gone to university and have argued a hundred different discussions about a hundred different human sciences. The child comes wired with its sense that the collective must stay together sees another child and says, great, another one like me, you know, I hope there's others, and he looks at the other child, and you hope so, I know that you also hope that there are others, and they both look to their sides to see if there's other babies as well, because that's, they're being governed in all purity by how we're wired, how we're made to exist, and in something very uncomplicated, which is the, the, the purpose, the the, the form that is our existence. Of course, the first thing that it notices is that it looks very different to mom and dad and other little children that have come to the house. But that does not get in the way with the way things are ordered so purely when they're babies. And instead of uh, suscitating or provoking suspicion or estrangement or fear or confusion, it, they just see it as, wow, that is really different. And they become fascinated, and they actually get attracted. And then, then becoming friends is a whole exhilarating experience. And if your parents that have had children do this, you know what I'm talking about. They kind of want to hang out more with that little kid that has a different skin color because they're being governed by the prime directive of the collective staying together. Now you see where I'm heading. We leave babyhood and childhood, yes, and we start, um, you know, complicating, needing to understand, needing to understand and creating systems and ways of, of basically, of survival.
I mean, with this intelligence, using this intelligence, this category of intelligence, which I referred to before, as proliferous and as effectively and as greatly as we can, always, yes, to make the uh, collective survive, but we kind of lose sight of that as we, this precocious intelligence starts making times of errors and mistakes that we learn to deal with. All of the problems that human civilization has, and I'm not talking about earthquakes and disease and, you know, fires that bite you or, or, or droughts that, you know, don't let food grow on trees. I'm just talking about all of the things that we suffer as a civilization in the world are created by yours truly, by humankind, because of the lack of harmony and the lack of uh, relation that we have to the pure sense of is that babies have, that we're born with. When we start going forward and creating this world, that clumsy, too good for its own good, ability to survive starts creating and living, learning to live with all its mistakes and that is the world. In that world that we have made, we have drowned, we're drowning ourselves with uh, opposing ideas. We create conflict and because we're so uh, not in touch with the simplicity of life, we have to find and resolve and answer the questions of these aired, not meant to be confrontations that we created ourselves because of our erring logic. So for example, sexuality, which is something completely simple and obvious. <laughs> it's completely obvious. There's nothing to reinvent. There's nothing that we need to be told. And we were even getting to the human science and, and psychology, sexual psychology, where we were understanding that apparently the way we grow up in this civilization is leading to guys and girls kind of feeling that they're a little incomplete and they go back to their same gender to try to make up for things that were afflicted on them when they were younger and some can go there easier than others, others don't seem to be as affected by the same problems. And we were starting to see the science and then in our precocious um, zealousness to quash the problems in Christopher Street and, and Stonewall and say, oh, uh, no violence above all, order, and whoever argues too strongly and shouts too violently needs to be suppressed. And we stopped ourselves from this discomfort, from resolving this discomfort and continuing to try to solve it in a science, in a biological uh, science of sexuality, and we turned it into a civil right. And in order for that to fit, we had to establish that you're born that way. And now we have been raising people to believe that you're born that way in order for the civil value of law to work. You have to let these people that are born that way exist so that now we have categories of people that are gay and not gay. We made a mess. Instead of becoming more intelligent about human intellect, about human sexuality, we've turned it into a civil construct that we now are, uh, have uh, developed a prowess in handling and knowing how to argue. And in reality, it was, all, it was nothing to argue before. We were just starting to understand how homosexuality in the species, as it occurs in all living forms, occur in our species in particular, given our very complicated society and very precociously airing human intelligence that creates so much excess and therefore we were kind of having a, developing a hunch that we're doing this we're making it worse than what nature would have done it on its own uh, but that all got silenced well you know we also do something like this with racism we have the babies let's go back to the babies the babies don't suffer racism they know that the other one looks different. They don't see such a difference in between Asian and uh, African American or African race. They see that they're both very different, but they don't think, well, the Asian is white, although it has eyes like that. The darker or black one is, is the, the other one is black and, and creating two kind of 
general areas of the world, we have done that. The babies kind of see, wow, there is like two, three, four different kinds. There's lots of different kinds of us. You know, they're seeing it differently. Um, in order for us to, what we did, we made it really stark and uh, uh, we, we uh, walled it into categories that must now face each other. We, thought, we made a mess. But in any case, racism as such, as what we know it today, doesn't really exist as a natural human emotion. We now treat it like it's something really bad that comes up in humans and people, like robbing or being uh, physically violent and, and harming another person's body by hitting them or attacking them, and things that are very human and generalized to anybody being capable of doing them, we kind of put racism in, in that category, and it is not, actually. Uh, what we do, okay, this is the interesting part that we have become very uh, inept in, 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 no, in, in seeing and in analyzing and in, in recognizing. The differences in our physical appearances are always with us. They're just part of the naturalness of the species for another God knows how many thousands of years that we've mixed so much we no, we'll no longer look any different. But until then, like so many like dogs, like so many other species, they play together and are completely different breeds. It's not such a big deal. They still recognize each other as dogs, as cats, as, you know, as fish, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it's what it is. It's not something unsurmountable. It's secondary. It's something that is secondary. You can still relate to somebody else as in all attributes of a human being and therefore be your best friend, be a, a bastard, be a great guy, be a terrible guy, uh, somebody you would totally trust, somebody you would never trust. It, that doesn't change. And we know this logically. But we're unable to live that as a society. Why are we unable to live that as a society? We can't, why can't we think of everybody as just Americans? And not think what kind of category of Americans they are and the problems that don't. We're not really going to be Americans until this. No, we already are Americans. We are making the mistake of putting the category before the humanity. And that is a, a complication that we created, like I explained before. It's not so easy, though, to resolve because it's something that we notice. Now, let's go back to the examples of the example of the baby because it's useful. The baby does not know hate because of how you look. If the little African American child steals, takes something, wants to play with his toy, and runs off with it, he will go to his parents and be upset and say, look, he stole my toy, you know, mom, 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 you know, do something. But you will never think that it's because he's black or African American. When we create a world that is because of being African Americans, the, we got to be that way, then we explain. It's another interesting part, I don't want to forget about that as the foreground and getting rid of that in the fore as a foreground and only feeling like that baby does that that he stole something from me or he's a criminal or he's a great guy and he's the best guy in the world and that be free and no longer have the race in the foreground is tricky and that's what I'm struggling to explain it's not so easy. Some people get it, and I've spoken to people about it, and they kind of get it, but it would require work, because we've already done the work of ruining it. <laughs> so because we've already done the work of ruining it, now we have to do the work to fix it, and, and have a good long period of healing therapy until one day generations will start arising, and children, and young people that never even thought of that person being a different race when they have problems, human problems, encounter human problems. The 
Yeah, the thing I did I wanted to mention that is tricky. Why does it so easily become uh, racism in so many societies, and why are there so few countries that actually don't have at all racism in this way and are are perfect examples of what I'm trying to describe? Some countries actually come very close to it, and I grew up part of my childhood in Argentina, and I was very familiar with Brazilian culture, which was right next to us, and they would come down, and you know, you'd see them, you were kind of knowledgeable of how they were in their own country, even if I never visited, but there's one thing that Argentinians and Brazilians had, had in common, is that, yeah, I would see as a child, I would notice that our groups of friends sometimes included, sometimes, not always, but sometimes included people of different, you know, African, uh, Brazilians, or well, there aren't many African Argentinians, but maybe an African Argentinian, and people would say uh, pseudonyms to the effect of their skin color, black, as uh, friendly to. It's something we don't have in English. We, we say chubby, we we say slim. Very little. We do a little bit of that, but in Spanish. And in other languages, uh, especially in Spanish, they're very proliferous with this kind of pseudonym that describes the person. And that's because they're at peace with how they look and their national origin. And they'll call somebody, I know this is in English, sounds weird They uh, to say, hey, Jew. <laughs> but Argentinians would go, Moishe, um, which is like a slang for Jew. And refer to their friend. Oh yeah, Moishe, he's our friend too, you know. And they would be talking about a Jew. Because it was never in the foreground. It was never like something that meant you had to walk on eggshells because that's what Jews were. We have been obsessing with fixing this so long that we have created and this is what I'm trying to explain. When we say black lives matter, yes, the point is totally true. I was, I've been saying, I was heartbroken that Obama didn't, uh, f you know, cut in half the African American population because it's harder for quote unquote white person to say, to be genuine, to be genuine and show people that genuineness and saying we really screwed up and I'm going to take care of this. But it would have been easier for an African American to say, I know you believe me when I know what we did in there as a president. So I saw it as a lost opportunity that Obama came to the presidency and he didn't fix the problem in the penitentiary system. So I'm not saying there is not a problem, totally the opposite. What I'm trying to explain is that the way to fix that problem is not by going at it face first, and, and only seeing that, because when we're naming it Black Lives Matter, yes, we're, we bring much overdue attention to problems in different areas of society, most importantly in prison, and the way police treat African Americans compared to immediately they just trigger, bring it down. And it has to do with something I explained also in the other video, which is a sort of self-love pride confidence that our cultures, uh, our, our African Americans, that means in our culture, people of African descent have. And I explained that it is understandable that that part of our culture has that because of how they've been put down. They needed to rise, and you know, also the teaching of our society of individualism and neoliberalism and have pride and make yourself and push forward and go forward and da 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 has helped that reaction, that natural reaction, come about very strongly in African Americans. And so when you try, police is a, uh, in any country, in any time in history, the weapon, the gun, in order to stop somebody else, is in the same category as invading a country. Uh, uh, robbing somebody of all their goods. It's taking away the freedom of existence. It's uh, it's delicate. We now are jaded because we, we've been growing up watching Cat and Mouse. Uh, you know, 
cats, uh, police and rob good guys and bad guys and robbers and thugs and and uh, this kind of thing. We think it's just a part of existence, but in reality, the social analysis, the sociological analysis of the police understanding, is a very serious very delicate, very sensitive matter that afflicts the citizenship with uh, bestowing the power of a killing weapon on some very select few people and look at what they're doing. <laughs> you know, they're just coming out and shooting whatever. No, he went for the wall and he went for the cell phone. He said, I'm sorry, and he got killed. It's, it's a disaster. It's a mess. And we have come so desensitized from the serious importance that that sector of countryhood and civilization requires that we don't even know how to... and so we shifted off that and we only focused meaning well on what has happened to African Americans because of this aspect of, of the police out of control except that you know we're also projecting towards a future, the continuance and the proliferation of the way of thinking about ourselves as divided before we are a people. We are made up of, because when you mention only one, when you say black, it means there's black in others. The subliminal is a conscious message that is being delivered onto society when you say black lives is, oh, there is a victimized group that takes precedence and foreground, which means there must be other groups, right? And there's, this group is separate to the rest. And so those ideas become the protagonist in the analysis of society and self-perception, self-perception of, of the country, of the nation, uh, starting with groups, and then if we get to be one people as a nation, okay, let's hope so. And so it, the focus subliminally and uh, literally becomes the, the injustice granted on, on this singular group of people, which also is becoming a little, you know, there's a lot of mixed races, but anyway, it's almost like forcing it because a lot of people, a lot of African Americans will tell you, Morgan Freeman said that on public television, uh, he was interviewed in a national network, he said, I get offended when they say Hit Black History Month. Why should we have a special month given to us? Because what? Because the poor little blacks, you know, they need some help, and now it's about Black Lives Matter because the police are mean only against them. And so the, 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 the set of ideas that it brings with it and gets deposited into the collective consciousness of the country is just kind of not dealing with racism. We think it is. We think we're good. And this is how America has always been about racism. We have always felt that we're tackling it, but by grabbing it from the head, we said, we don't want it to go away, okay? And we stare at the head, at, 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 in the eyes, and we say, we don't want it to go away, okay? So don't go away. Stay right there. And don't go away. I mean, go away and stay right there. We, we want it to go away. We want it to go away and stay right there, but go away. It's, it's, it's sort of a catch-22 that we don't see because it is a little bit of an elaborate... Uh, I won't, it's not intellectual, but it is a little bit of a complex notion to get across and explain. And, and, and that's why I'm making this video, because hopefully somebody will have watched it to the end and understand the difficulty but also understand how important it is to protect that difficulty so that we can continue the right way about it and have a country that is all people first and then the problems that have led to fueling and nurturing aired notions of categorization dealt with so that they don't continue nurturing those differences. But see how the critical order is different there? We deal with the problems that are nurturing and proliferating this mistaken way of going about our society. It's completely different than saying, 
fix the problems that are making this group or category exist. Because when I say make that category exist, we're making it exist. It's, it's, it's a catch-22. I don't know how best to explain it. I hope that this time I succeeded. I'm sorry that it was so long, 40 minutes, but you know, maybe one person sat through the whole thing and maybe the audio came out audible and something good came out of this. All right, so long.